That is a great accomplishment. That I, is I, the uh, most insipid applause I've ever heard. Let's give the award. Yes, and it, it is worth it's worth celebrating. I thank the Lord for each one of you in, in what in how you give to the Lord. Yes, you give of your financial uh, uh, resources, uh, but you also give in many other ways as well. And uh, so God is doing a work in us, and uh, we need to thank Him for all that He has done with us. This, at this particular point, as you can guess, we have an opportunity once again uh, to make a gift to the Lord. So uh, may, may it be a, a, a great uh, blessing and a joy as you give that.
that we have, Lord, comes from you. And Lord, we say thank you. Lord, we pray that the gift that you present this morning in your name, Lord, may have and make a difference here at this church, in our community, and throughout the world. Lord, we pray that your name might come forth in great power, in great might. For I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Let me uh, share with you a uh, few of the uh, events that are happening in our church family over the next few days. Uh, first of all, uh, Wednesday night, uh, dinner is being served again in the form of breakfast casseroles and fruit salad. And then, of course, the Christian Life Development uh, Center classes uh, will follow that. Uh, newsletter articles are due on Friday. Uh, next will be a short week, so please have things in as soon as possible. The church family Thanksgiving dinner is next Sunday, November 19th. Please sign up in the communications room if you plan to attend. Church decoration for the Christmas season will take place on Saturday, uh, November 25th at 10 a.m. Uh, please see either myself or Bob Wixo, uh, so that uh, or Bob Brown because the uh, manger scene is also going to be set up on that day uh, to let them know that youth will be available uh, to help on that. Uh, the worship ministry is looking for volunteers to do the, uh, uh, let me, I've skipped something here and it's really important because I've spent a lot of time on this, uh, the Christmas variety program, so I can't, I can't skip this, will take place on Sunday, December the 3rd at 6.30 p.m. And I hope that you have circled your calendar on that and a number of you are, uh, are part of that particular program. Now, the worship ministry is looking for volunteers to do the card testimonies for the Christmas variety program. Some of you, a number of you, have signed up for that. Uh, Dan will be uh, uh, videoing those today uh, at the conclusion of this uh, service. So please see him uh, so that you can use your pen and your cardboard and you can get uh, that on uh, video. Uh, see the film series Christ Reveal uh, for a free starting that started on November the 7th uh, daily, a nine-part documentary at a website included in the back of your church bulletin. That's all that uh, we have for the present time. And so let's move on to uh, God's Word, which comes today from 2 Peter. Uh, chapter 1, verses 16 to 21. So we're looking now at 2 Peter 1, verse 16. And these are the words that God's Spirit uh, motivated Peter to write. For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, This is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. We also had the prophetic message as something completely reliable and you will do well to pay attention to it, as to the light shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things, for prophecy never had its origin in the human will. But prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. May 
thought increase and expand our understanding of who he is with attention to his word at this time. Well, once again, good morning, church. Karl Marx once commented that man makes religion, religion doesn't make man. He said, religion is the opium of the people. It's something that people created to make themselves feel good. And that, that socialist theory has never worked out in practice. It's never made anyone happy. Uh, even though he said that freedom from religion was what would cause people to be truly happy. Uh, in practice, it really never has happened. The problem is that much of the socialist teaching that would, would have been railed against when he, when he came out with it and, and in the uh, uh, mid middle of uh, the last century uh, has actually worked its way into our culture. Much of the socialist teacher is prevalent in our society with its anti-religious uh, uh, bent has become quite predominant. And it's not only out there in the society, but it has come into the church as well. Many modern scholars hold to what is called the documentary hypothesis. The documentary hypothesis holds that the writings of scripture were developed over time through various editors and, and various writers. Uh, in, in other words, that scriptures themselves have have come about because people created them. And these are people who are studying the Bible. These are, these are people who call themselves Bible scholars. That's a, a pretty sad state of event. Now, archaeology has proved over and over again the things that are in the scriptures that are, that are accurate. In fact, nothing in archaeology has ever disproved anything in scripture. And now we have the Dead Sea Scrolls that have, have brought us back uh, a thousand years previous to anything that we had before, that we have manuscripts of the scripture, and we find that they're incredibly accurate. And uh, uh, for instance, we have almost the entire book of Isaiah from the Dead Sea Scrolls, and in its transmission over thousands of years, it is, it is unchanged. Um, in, in, in its uh, entirety, it's unchanged. Uh, in what we find in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Scriptures are proved over and over again, but, but the questions still keep coming up. Now it's important that we, we look at these questions. Is the Bible really the Word of God? Is it truly reliable? If we're going to found our lives, if we're going to stake our lives on what's in, in Scriptures, we better know that it's from God. and It's not just something that people came up with. Because if people came up with it themselves, well, what, what makes their opinion any better than ours? And why wouldn't we change it over time? I mean, you know, we know a whole lot more than they knew back then, so why wouldn't we change it over time? But if it's the Word of God who is unchanged and is unchanging, who already knows the end of times, who already is, knows everything beyond any of our technologies or any of our discoveries, if it is the Word of God, then we can stand on it, then we can then we find it reliable. These are important questions. Can we rely on God on the scripture as being the word of God? Well let's find out. But before we do, let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, as we come to your word, we pray that you would reveal your word to us as what it is, living and active. That through your word you not only teach us your ways, you not only inform us, but you make your presence known to us. And so in this time we pray that you would send the true teacher of the Holy Spirit to touch and enliven our hearts and to turn them towards you. We pray for the one who teaches that you hide him behind the cross. We come to this place to see Jesus and him only. And it is in his precious name that we pray. Amen. I don't know if you happen to have watched any of the uh, Christ Revealed series that we told you about in your bulletin. Uh, I think they're well done. In the second one of that series, they feature a homicide detective who specializes in cold cases, cases that have been 
uh, open for years. They, they're not able to, uh, uh, they've never been able to solve them. And uh, uh, at one point, he and his wife had started going to church. He considered himself an atheist, but they thought they had the other kids, and church was the good thing to do, so they started going to church. And he decided that he would use his skills as a detective to look back at the story of the resurrection. Now, as an atheist, he considered it an outrageous story that anybody would actually believe that someone was raised from the dead. And so uh, he set out to uh, find the evidence. And uh, everything that he found in scriptures and in history and in church history uh, pointed to the fact that there was only one thing that stood in the way of uh, the truth of the resurrection. And that was his own preconception that it was impossible. Because he came with the preconception that, that it couldn't happen. That was the only thing that, that disproved it. But everything else in scripture proved that the resurrection actually happened. Well, that detective obviously today is a Christian because he's come to believe that, that this is actually the word of God. But that question is exactly what Peter is addressing here in 2 Peter chapter 1. It begins in verse 16. We did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We were eyewitnesses. Now, let me unpack this for you for a moment. And when Peter gets to verse 16 here, he has already told them a few things before that here in chapter 2. One is that, that Peter knows that he is not going to be around for very long, that he is soon to die. In uh, verse 13, we read, Peter says, I, I think it's right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body, because I know that I will soon put it, as, put it aside as the Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. Peter knows somehow the Lord has revealed to him that he's going to die soon. Now, when we know that we're going to die, we want to make sure that our affairs are in order, right? We want to make sure that the things that are really important to us will last. Peter wants to leave a legacy, and the most important thing to him is the preaching of the gospel, which he has seen with his own eyes, which he is eyewitnessing. He wants to make sure that his witness continues, and so he writes again to the church, emphasizing the very things that will, that will help the, his uh, his legacy to continue, the, the word of the Lord to continue. He wants to remind us. Because after all, he knows that after he dies, after the other apostles die, there will be no more eyewitnesses. And it's one thing to be able to say, this is what I saw. I saw it with my own eyes. It's another to say, well, someone who saw this told me. And then the question comes up, well, how do you know you can trust that person and what they told you. Especially with something as outrageous as someone rising from the dead. So Peter wants to be sure that, that this will continue. You know, my, my mother used to teach us when we were little, believe only half of what you see and none of what you hear. Have you ever heard that? I still don't get it. I don't know how that works. I don't know how we function with that. But, but I can tell you this, it makes you very skeptical of everything. You, you, you probably wouldn't believe anything. Uh, if, if you're really, really held to that. Peter wants to be sure that we remember, that we, that we believe. Here in, in, in verse 15, just before the scripture we read today, Peter says, and I will make every effort, now knowing that he's going to die, I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. He's sort of overemphasizing. He's just making sure because this is too important to die with him. He has seen the truth, not just heard it, but he's seen it as, as, he, as he heard and experienced the Son of God living among him, dying among them, and then rising from the dead before their, their very eyes. Now think about the cultures that Peter is writing to. Peter's writing to Christians who are out there in the world, and if you look at the, the names of the towns that he's writing to, you recognize that, that, that people are living out in, in pa predominantly pagan cultures. And in these pagan cultures, 
uh, everything that they believe comes out of stories that someone made up somewhere, but we don't know where. These legends, these stories of what happened with the gods, they call them myths, mythology, right? The myths about the stories. There's something that we've heard, something that we've been taught, but we don't know exactly where because these aren't things that have actually happened in history. And when Peter writes to the church in verse 16, he says, we did not follow cleverly devised stories. The word stories in the Greek is new thoughts or myths. We didn't create myths like the pagan cultures created myths just so you'd get a, a, a feeling of, a, a, of a direction or, or that sort of thing. But we, we told you what we eyewitnessed. These are, these are not myths. These are not outrageous concocted stories. These are, these are eyewitness reports. Peter's good friend and, and fellow apostle John put it this way in his letter that he wrote to the churches, saying the same thing, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we seen with our eyes, which we looked at and our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. They want to make sure that people remember that these are eyewitnesses. To the, to the majesty and the glory of God. How does Peter know these things about God? He knows because he's seen. He's seen not only the resurrected Jesus, but he's seen Jesus revealed in all his glory, which is what he's referring to here in this passage in what we call the transfiguration, which we'll get to in just a second. Uh, here in verses 17 and 18, uh, Peter is, is telling about the transfiguration. Now, when the transfiguration happened, it happened just six days after Jesus had come to his disciples and said, who do people say that I am? And who do you say that I am? And Peter blurts out, you're the Messiah. You're the Messiah. When we read about this in Mark's Gospel. If you know anything about Mark's Gospel, you know that Mark was, was not one of the apostles, but Mark... Um, records the eyewitness testimonies of Peter. So Mark's gospel is really Peter's story. Um, and, and here, in, in Peter's story, we read, it, first of all, Peter confessed that Jesus is the Messiah. And after he confessed that Jesus is the Messiah, Jesus then tells them that the Messiah, the Son of Man, must be turned over to the religious leaders, and he will be crucified. Die, but on the third day he'll rise from the dead. And then he not only says that, but then he says, if you're going to follow me, I'm going to Jerusalem. If you're going to follow me, you have to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. And then six days later, Peter takes his inner circle, the, the three of Peter, James, and John, and he, he leads them up a, a mountain for for something that they'll never forget. We read about that. I, it's, I think it's worth looking at in Mark's Gospel, chapter 9, beginning at verse 2. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah Mo and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let's put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. He didn't know what to say. They were so frightened. And then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud, This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. They kept the matter to themselves, discussing what rising from the dead meant. You catch that? Yeah. Jesus has told them he's going to Jerusalem, he's going to be crucified, he's going to die, he's going to rise from the dead. Here he has shown them all his glory and told them, don't tell anybody about this until I've risen from the dead. And then they're still talking about, 
What does he mean by rising from the dead? You see, the story sounds so outrageous that even the apostles, after they've been told by Jesus, after it's been confirmed to them, they still don't get it. They, 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 they're thinking, well, is he speaking figuratively, metaphorically? Is this some philosophical teaching that we're just not catching it? What does he mean by rising to the dead from the dead? It doesn't occur to them that he's meaning that he's going to literally die and literally rise physically from the dead. It, it just doesn't sink in because we, we have we have nothing to compare this to. It, it's just not done. It, it, it just doesn't happen. Like like our atheist detective says, it, it, it just sounds like an outrageous story. So even the apostles don't get it. But here in, in, in Peter's letter, he affirms, we ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. Now, if you've been paying close attention, you may notice that Mark's account of what Peter remembers of the transfiguration differs a little bit from what Peter writes here in, in this letter. In the letter, Peter says that the voice came uh, and said, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. In Mark's Gospel, it says, this is my son whom I love, listen to him. Well, which is it? I mean, they're both supposed to be Peter's recollections. How come they differ? Actually, Matthew's Gospel puts them together because, because the voice said both. This is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased, listen to him. So all of it's there, and Peter remembers in bits and pieces, he remembers a bit here, a bit there. And some people will look at this and say, well, the scriptures are inconsistent. Our detective friend from, uh, from Christ Revealed would say just the opposite. When they do a forensic study, if there are eyewitnesses, their stories should differ some. Because people see things differently, people recall things differently. And if their eyewitness is genuine, there will be some differences. So he says, when, when I saw differences in the accounts, uh, it didn't throw me because that actually affirmed what was there. And so here we find really uh, that this is more of an affirmation than anything else. But Peter knows that people will be tough to convince because this sounds like such an outrageous story. But he knows it's the truth because... He's an eyewitness. We know the truth because we have not only the eyewitness of those who saw and reported, but also we have the witness of the Holy Spirit that this is the word of God. That this is, that this is from things that have actually happened. And the Holy Spirit also confirms that in our hearts. You know, at, at one point, Jesus gave a very difficult teaching. And... Not to go down a rabbit trail about what that teaching was, but when people heard it, they left. They, they started leaving Jesus, saying, no, no, this is too much, I'm out of here. And then Peter turns to the twelve and he says, what about you? Are, are you going to leave as well? John chapter 6, verses 66 to 69, we read, At this point, many of the disciples turned away, deserted him, and then Jesus turned to the twelve and asked, Are you also going to leave? And then Simon Peter replies, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words that give eternal life. We believe, and we know you are the Holy One of God. Where else would we find the words of life? This this book, this Bible, this is the Word of God. It is the Word that gives eternal life. And there's nowhere else, no other sacred writings, no other scriptures, no other great wisdom of man that will lead us to God and to eternal life but this book. In this book, God has preserved for us a testimony of what he did when he sent his son into the world to die for our sins, crucified on the cross. In this book, we learn that he was raised from the dead. In this book, we know that, that God carried prophets along and revealed himself to us through the writing of this book. This is the word of God. It is truth that is unchanged. It is unchanging. Peter writes, so that we will 
look to the scriptures as a testimony that is reliable so that we won't fall prey to those false teachers who would come up with myths or, or would water down the word of God or would twist it to say what they want to say or dismiss it as, as the words of people. This is the truth of God which is unchanged and unchanging because God is unchanged and unchanging. As Peter writes in verse 20, above all you must understand that the, that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. Prophecy never had its origin in the human will. But prophets, though humans, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Prophets spoke as they were carried along. How did we get the Scriptures? Did people make them up? No. God carried people along. God molded them and shaped them and, and, and uh, arranged the affairs of their life such that they would be sensitive to the leading of His Spirit, such that they would be able to listen to Him, sometimes by direct word from God and sometimes just by a sense of God's leading and, and the way that He's molded and shaped these people. But God has made sure that what He what is revealed in his book is accurate to who he is. Our God is great enough that he can write a book, even through other people. Paul knows that God spoke through him as well. Peter knows this, Peter is saying this, but Paul also knew that when he was writing, that the Holy Spirit was speaking through him and, and giving him a word for the churches, that it wasn't just something he was generating on his own. So, so Paul writes in Galatians chapter 1, Dear brothers and sisters, I want you to understand that the gospel message I preach is not based on mere human reason. I received my message from no human source, and no one taught me. Instead, I received it by direct revelation from Jesus Christ. Paul knows that what he is teaching is a direct revelation from Jesus Christ. Peter recognizes Paul's writing as Scripture. And the writings of the other apostles within that. When Peter continues in 2 Peter 3, uh, verses 15 and 16, he talks about this. And it's sort of a, an offhand remark, but we see in here very clearly that that Peter considers what Paul has written to be scriptures for the church. 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. Just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. Did you catch that? The wisdom that God gave him. Not just because Paul's such a smart guy. But the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters. Speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand. Which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. Do you catch that? The other scriptures. Peter recognizes that what Paul is writing is scriptures. That on par with the other scriptures. That here we contain the word of life. From the source of life. In 1 Peter 1 verse 25. Peter writes the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. A word that endures forever. Paul puts it this way in 2 Timothy 3 16 to 17. All scripture is God breathed. And is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Can we trust this book as being God's word? Either we can trust it completely, knowing that there is a God who, who can carry people along and make his will known, or we can't trust it at all. If it isn't wholly true, then it isn't true at all. And if we spend our time picking and choosing and say, well, I believe this part of it, I don't believe this part of it, I think this part's accurate, but that part's outdated, then what we're doing is we're creating our own religion that fits our own desires and doesn't conform to the Word of God. And that's idolatry. You know, 
Billy Graham, early in his ministry, had a crisis of faith, a crisis of, uh, of whether the Bible was inerrant or not. He was already preaching at this point. He was at a preaching conference, and he went out into the woods to pray and wrestle with God. And he found a stump, and he laid open his scriptures, and he basically said, God, I need to know. If this is true, if this is your word, because I want, if I'm going to preach it, I want to preach it as your word. But I can't preach it if I don't know. And somehow God spoke to him in that time, and he came away determined that, that he would throw aside the questions from now on. From now on, he would stand on God's word and preach God's word. And God used him in powerful ways, didn't he? Because he recognized that, that the Bible is God's Word, and he never preached anything but the Word of God. You know, I believe for every one of us who are going to follow Christ, there needs to come that crisis of faith when we, when we determine if God's Word is really God's Word, and if we will follow it and stand on it, if we will take the time to learn it and let it mold us and shape us and direct our lives whether we can trust God that much or whether we'll go on with whatever religion we feel comfortable with and, and weave our own way through and, and make our own thing up as we go along. That crisis has to come to us so that we can stand on God's Word and God's Word alone. We find the truth in God's Word and we live it out in our lives. Hank Hanegraaff wrote a book about the divine inspiration of Scripture called Has God Spoken? And in the conclusion to that book, he writes this. <clears throat> Our challenge is to build a lighthouse in the midst of the gathering darkness. To be change agents in the culture rather than a microcosm of the culture. To be transformed by the renewing of our minds rather than conformed to culture. Make no mistake, we will either drift into the spiritual malaise of a biblically bankrupt Europe, or we will experience Revival like that of the persecuted church in China. You will ultimately be the difference maker, not as an individual, but as a member of the body of Christ. My challenge to you is this. Get into the Word and get the Word into you. Memorize, meditate, and mine the wealth of the Word. Stem the tide of darkness by being ever ready to provide proof of the Bible's divine inspiration. When we know, when we are confident that the Bible is God's word, then we stand on solid ground, then we can move ahead in things knowing confidently that we are doing what God calls us to do. We can then proclaim with confidence on Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed to him for that day. My faith is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. When we know these things, we can live confidently and boldly in the world today. We did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to Him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, whom I love. With Him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with Him on the sacred mount. We also have the prophetic message as something completely, completely reliable. And you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. Prophecy never had its origin in the human will. But prophets... Though humans spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Your word is true. Help us as believers to stand upon your word. To stand confidently in all things when it comes to your word, Lord. To know that 
no matter what the culture around us is saying, no matter what direction people around us might be taking, that we follow your path, knowing that it is always true, that it is always right. Empower your people, Father. Help us to be bold and courageous as we stand for the truth. Help us at the same time to be gracious, not ever feeling threatened or defensive because we know your word's truth no matter what people may say no matter how they may rail against it, no matter how outrageous they may think it is, we know it is true, and the truth always comes out. The truth always reveals itself. Help us to stand on that truth as followers of your way. In Jesus' name we pray.